All right. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, I, guess, I guess I'll introduce myself. Hi. I'm Wendy Nather. I'm uh, the research director for the enterprise security practice at 451 Research. Uh, we're an analyst firm. We're like Gartner Forrester, except we don't have a magic geometry. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, what, what, one of the things we do do, though, is that um, what one of our department surveys executives, you know, we interview them at length on what they're buying and why. So if you have a lot of opinions about, about what you're buying and you would like to express them, you know, like an hour at a time, come see me afterwards because we're always recruiting commentators. If you're opinionated, we want you. Uh, so we're going to talk about software assurance in a target-rich environment. Uh, this is me. Um, Actually, this is good because it doesn't show how close the target actually is. I was going to Photoshop it and make it smaller to make it more impressive, but no. <laughs> um, so that's me. Um, the state of software security, that's a really, really big issue and, and a very broad question. And, you know, you could either do it, you know, with a thumbs up or a thumbs down. You could be really confused. Um, one of the things, though, that really worries me is that we have been tracking um, how many people, how many executives say that they are buying application security products and how much they're spending, you know, year to year and what they're buying, which vendors they're changing from and everything. But the scary thing is, is that year over year, almost 50% of the IT executives that we talk to have said that they have no plans to buy application security software. No plans. And, and that's the scary part. And, you know, we've been trying to figure out why this is. Because we have a lot of people here, and I'll introduce these guys in a moment, who are working very hard to secure their software. What's the difference between them and the other almost 50% who are just saying, you know, we're not going to deal with this? So let me introduce this to, uh, everybody. In, in no particular order, you raise your hand. Sean Barnum, uh, who's the cybersecurity principal with MITRE. Praveer Chandra, over there, who's a security architect from Bloomberg. Uh, Suprotik Goza, did I do that right? Do that right? Close enough. <laughs> Head of security and risk and control uh, for uh, Royal Bank of Scotland. Ajoy Kumar from UBS. Uh, Jason Rothhaupt, yay. Um, he's a senior director of application security at Broadridge. Um, and I think I am supposed to say that you are not speaking for your company. Is that right? Yeah, okay. Not speaking for his company. Yeah, okay. Nobody's speaking for it. Take, take all your name tags off, and we'll, we'll just pretend. And then uh, Ramin Safai. Did I say that right? All right, excellent. Chief, uh, CISO for Jeffries. So let's go for the topics, and then I'm going to ask the folks to turn off the projector because I don't think we need them. Um, we're going to talk about understanding the need, the stakeholder requirements when it comes to application security. I really want to talk about what works because nobody is brave enough to come up on stage and say, this is working for us because everybody else in the audience is going to go, pull, and you may be deep pantsed before you get off the stage. So talking about what works and doing it in a careful considered way is something that I, I hope to get out of the panel today. And products and partnerships, um, the supply chain, uh, assuring the, the security of that, the software supply chain is a big issue these days, apparently, for, uh, especially for these folks. So uh, we're going to get going. Um, if I could get, could I get someone to just turn off the, the projector there and, yeah. All right. All right, good. The other thing is that we're going to have to pass a mic back and forth, um, so uh, somebody will have the talking stick at any given time. Um, so given that nobody's here speaking for their company, um, and given that nobody wants to talk about either bad news or good news when it comes to security software, I'm going to ask you, what are the biggest challenges that you are having um, to get trustworthy hardware and software in your enterprise? Is anybody willing to... Raise your hand and start with that. What's the biggest challenge? So when uh, we think about this trustworthy hardware and software, it's basically a big problem to solve, right? We start with software which is sitting in NFC devices, mobile devices, web 
devices, uh, SCADA systems and whatnot. So software is everywhere. And uh, solving the problem for trustworthy hardware and software in that scenario is very, very hard as you can imagine because we are just surrounded by software. And uh, as far as I can tell, most of the industry is basically still debating whether security is uh, a functional requirement or it's a non-functional requirement. I think we need to get forward of the debate. So example I'll use it is that uh, if you're, uh, somebody's constructing a bridge, bridge architect, bridge designer, bridge workers, bridge suppliers, everyone knows that bridge has a requirement that it has to transport people and it should not fall. We, see, we have seen one or two examples of the bridges falling, uh, but not a whole lot. They have been very secure, they have been meeting their functional requirements. We just have to get past in security whether we have to do it bolt on or built in. We have to basically have the enough knowledge with everyone who is working on the project in building that product that it has to meet the requirements and security is just another requirement, not a non-functional requirement. It is part of doing business it should deliver what it is supposed to deliver. So that's how would I would basically start the problem. Uh, yeah, uh, how, how, do you, how do you define that requirement? I, I've had actual d discussions when I was a CISO with developers who said, you didn't say that encrypt view state was a requirement. So especially doing this retroactively, um, you know, getting something fixed at somebody else's cost and convincing them that it should be fixed uh, because this really is a security problem um, it, you know, it, everybody knows about. What's interesting, though, is especially when you're writing contracts, when you're doing um, engagement statements of work, you have to be very precise about your requirements so that you can tell, you know, if you're taking it to court, whether, you, whether that, that group was meeting it or not. Uh, and so a lot of organizations have defaulted to using the OWASP Top 10 as a set of criteria for their statement of work, for, for their deliverable acceptance criteria. And that's good and bad because there's a lot more beyond the, the 10 um, that you should be thinking about. But because we don't have a good list, that's what people are defaulting to. It's the only list we have. Who else would like to comment? So the biggest challenge that I've seen uh, working in a couple of organizations, uh, especially trying to get an application security program going, is uh, naturally the developers will push back and say, oh, my time to market is going to go up, the cost is going to go up. And uh, we really cannot, uh, you know, yeah, you want us to do this, uh, it's going to be a lot more expensive. And that's why you need uh, stakeholder buy-in, right? Uh, it is. Uh, partly they're true. I mean, if you tell them no, it's not true, it's, uh, that, that, that is not a fact. Uh, some time to market will go up because, yes, you're doing a lot more product testing, and some of the test cases are specific to security. Uh, you, you might be running pen tests, you might be doing source code analysis. So there are a couple of, you know, de depending on your build model, you might be putting in some extra steps. That's why stakeholder build buy-in is very, very important. In, in one of my previous uh, uh, employers, what we found that we were trying to develop a product which was very critical. The, the company was spending almost $30 million on it, right? You're spending a $30 million product, you're spending almost $10, $15 million in marketing the product, and one of the things you're seeing is that product is secure. That product is used by financial, you know, it is a financial services product. I've got to be careful not to mention the product. Uh, but that's where stakeholders come in. Your salespeople, your product manager, if they realize that actually what you're building is not secure, they have a problem. Because that's what they're betting the bank or rather their product on. So getting the right stakeholders for every project is very, very important and making sure that you know, they, they understand what the value is, is what is going to make your product a success. Just a few things very briefly. For focusing on the requirements question, there's lots of dimensions to that, but I think two of the main ones is obviously, as you said um, when you started out, is just a willingness to be explicit. And if anything golden lining might come out of the healthcare.gov debacle, it's the fact that everyone in the world is now seeing a situation where somebody built something, didn't think about security, and now they're standing with their pants around their ankles. Um, so executives and people who aren't considering that might stop and think about it, so that's a positive. But once you get to explicit, you also be, have to be specific. You can't simply, when they go explicit the first time, most of them say, oh, it's secure. <laughs> but you have to be more specific than that. And, and I think it takes um, characterizing knowledge around what is and what isn't and what sort of characteristics you're looking for. So. That's another thing that there's been work going on, I think made a lot of advancement in the last five, ten years on 
codifying that sort of stuff so you can be explicit, not just in security features, which that's easy to codify, that's functionality, but how do you actually define those non-functional characteristics of things and what you need to um, validate is not present, what sort of issues and, and weaknesses and vulnerabilities and what is resistant there. But I think the explicit and the specific are the two dimensions to that that we're making progress on, but we still have a long way to go. Yeah, yeah. Is this a problem for everybody else in the audience? Is this one of the challenges, being specific enough with your development team? Yeah, it's, it's either a choice between giving somebody a huge PDF of all the things that they should, not, should or should not be doing or just changing it to, you know, something that says don't do stupid stuff with your code, which I'm really tempted to do. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you also have to explain why some of those requirements are there and how what they're doing could be bad. Yet, yes, I know you think that's a test harness, but that's also a back door. Don't do that. You have to have those, those sorts of discussions. And I, and I think one of the interesting things is when do you get that in there? So yeah. uh, you know, as practitioners, we spend a lot of time getting these design pieces into the formal SDLC. But now I'm kind of seeing this pre-SDLC like proof of concept phase. So you actually have to get it out there before the project is official to make sure that as they're evaluating pieces of a solution, they're not only considering those functional requirements, but they're considering the security ones um, as they're, they're doing that, that POC, hey, can this work? Can this solve our problem? Can it also do it securely is that question. And that's a lot less formal in, in a lot of the situations I've seen. And that, that's you know, one of the, the problems there um, to get it done early. So yeah, Jason, your point is valid. We see that uh, more and more because there is agile development now and basically a lot of things is happening in parallel. So how do you basically get into SDLC, so, so to call secure SDLC, when you're doing agile development? So what kind of stories that you have to basically build into their agile model where they can actually deliver on what you're wanting, including the abuse cases that you have been mentioning? So that has to be part of the story because the language is changing, the workforce is changing, there are a lot newer workers who basically probably in a couple of years would not know what waterfall method meant. So you have to basically adapt and uh, tune yourself to the time and say, yeah, we'll write stories for so to call non-functional security requirements. Well, I agree with that. I think that one of the biggest challenges when talking about challenges, the two areas that at least I see is that one of them is that a lot of our software development is being outsourced to cloud-based services. Mm -hmm. And that's a challenge for us regarding measuring the security within those environments compared to what we were measuring in-house. Uh, Agile is the, definitely the other one with regard to mobility as well. You know, we don't even know what we're supposed to develop in some of these cases. Mm -hmm. To write the requirements ahead of time becomes quite a challenge. Yeah. So um, don't be stupid is the right approach. <laughs> yeah, don't be stupid. Um, yeah, and in, in the spirit of trying to, to keep this panel talking about what works, what I'm hearing is that you have to get into the SDLC or the pre-SDLC when the project is just a twinkle in the project manager's eye or in the CEO's eye and start getting those requirements in there. You have to be able to be dynamic, change the language with the times, You've got to be able to cast things in terms of security stories if it's, a, if it's agile. Um, so you have to be able to fit to, to the activities that the development group is doing. A anything else that has worked for you? Uh, well, I guess just another aspect of that, uh, of that problem that I'll throw out is sort of a lot of the, the common industry trend right now in the technology space moving towards more of a DevOps model for actually developing and deploying infrastructure where instead of actually having a bunch of system administrators that are actually configuring each machine uniquely, tweaking the config files on this one, that one, et cetera, instead people are writing code to go and do it for them. So you're actually building more software that now is actually in control of all of your infrastructure. So I think the, the sort of the next, or the next phase maybe of software security is actually figuring out how are we now securing all of the software that actually is our infrastructure, right? Because it's no longer one-offs of people like configuring individual machines. People write scripts to configure hundreds of machines at a time. Uh, and I think that's sort of the next challenge. And, and really what it comes down to is that we have to start, in my opinion at least, using some of the techniques that we've applied to the software security space for managing complexity, for managing uh, vulnerabilities, things of that nature, but thinking about it in a much different way than a developer, thinking about it like an infrastructure guy uh, as, in terms of how they're configuring and deploying infrastructure. 
Yeah, because thanks to the cloud, we can now fail at scale. And, and really rapidly. Yeah, and very rapidly. <laughs> fail fast, fail, fail wide. Um, let's talk about return on security investment because I, I personally hate that term. I don't believe in it for security. I think there's loss avoidance, but I think that's it. Uh, who, who on the panel believes in return on security investment? Nobody does. Awesome. Well, uh, I know yeah, the way I put it. I mean, sorry. <laughs> it's you know when you're initially going for a project, you uh, I, I don't I don't know what the process is in other organizations, organizations I've worked with. You have to come up with a business case, and with security, that's always a big problem coming up with a business case, right? How do you how do you I mean, you can sell FUD to a certain limit, but then, then what else do you uh, bring in? So there's been a couple of cases which help us, especially uh, us uh, writing the business cases. It's things like um, a regulator uh, come in, they fine you. There's uh, chances of uh, you know, missing a PCI audit or a QSA audit and things like that. So those are things you can bring in, and that can help your business case. And, and kind of makes it a little more real so that you can get it passed. So w one thing I wanted to add to it, because I think when, when you first asked the question, I completely agreed with you that you know, there's, it's cost avoidance, <laughs> not really investment. But in actually thinking back at some of the, uh, some of the more interesting projects that we've done, you know, at least at Bloomberg, and, and I've seen these in a number of other companies as well when I was a consultant, where if you actually spend the time up front to design a platform well, it actually enables your business to move in new directions that it wouldn't be able to move into otherwise, right? If you can actually figure out the right way to, I don't know, enable secure mobile applications or enable uh, secure uh, data from, you know, moving from place to place or enable uh, a way to actually store your company's data securely in a cloud environment, you've actually opened up new opportunities for the business then to determine what additional functionality or additional features for your customers, whatever business you happen to be in, uh, to actually build new technologies and new products on top of it in a secure fashion. Yeah, and one of the things that had worked for me in the past to convince um, the, the stakeholders to, to include security is to tie it to resilience because everybody is afraid of an outage. Uh, also, developers are much more likely to believe in a stupid user than they are in a malicious user. So if you go to them and say, you know, would you believe this, you know, this stupid user could bring down your app, they go, oh, I better write something to, to keep that from happening. And then you're halfway there to protecting against the malicious user. So I found that, that coding it that way um, sometimes helps sell it better. It, it, does that work for you guys? So one of, one of the things, at least, we, we see security as a risk management. Mm -hmm. uh, as a risk management, there's certain risks that the company does not want to tolerate. But selling it to the management the appropriate way, I think, is a key issue. I mean, our management at least recognizes that the security return on investment is a very difficult concept for security because you, you might have a single bullet and it kills you. And that could be a huge issue because the risks has never happened before. So will it happen again? You know, a DDoS attack. If you have never experienced it, will you go spend $200,000 a year insuring against it? So we put it into the same bucket. But I have to say application security fights for a lot of other security budget in my budget assessments. So you have to find out, can I get a better uh, bang for buck doing another project within security rather than application security? Uh, what I found very useful is that developer training by far, a one-day training divided into two half days, pays off significantly for those applications that are um, top-tier apps. Um, because once the developers get it, then they are bought in, and they, they will develop better code from day one. Uh, again, my problem a lot of times is dealing with development communities or areas that are outside of our organization, and they don't necessarily follow those routines. So, um, similar to the, your thoughts, just a different perspective, because I, I think you have given a CISO perspective, I'll give you the development side of the perspective. So what you said, doing the trainings and basically fight for the budget, those are all real, but what I've seen is that education and training to the CI organization goes a long way. The reason is that basically they see it in two ways. One, that they are getting the culture training, it's a behavior change program. So the culture is changing because the developers are learning uh, security techniques and they're applying on an ongoing basis. So that's one incentive. So there is organic growth. Second is, Ramiri is not sitting with the CIO saying, I'm going to basically fix these for you. He is just educating the CIOs, saying that you fix it because this is your problem. I'm helping you fix it. So he's coming as a partner, not as basically saying that you fix it or I'm going to fix it. So the relationship goes 
much better. And I think those are unstated ROI or incentives of the program, which basically are always understated. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Andy Ellis, who's the CISO for Akamai, does it that way too. He goes to the, when the business comes to him and says, is this secure? He says, I don't know, what do you think? And he makes them do the homework and figure it out against their risk model. And, and, and once they figure it out, they say, well, we think this is pretty good. What do you think? And he goes, okay, you know, tweak that there and then you're good to go. So, you know, he makes it their decision and, and they have to figure it out. Uh, and so there's a lot less conflict for him. Uh, the business owns it more, and, and everybody's happy. And everyone's seen the you know bug in the SDLC, how much it costs to fix it. Just take an SOW from a legacy remediation project mm -hmm. and a new developed application where you're in there from the you know the beginning, and the timelines and the dollars at the end tell the story for you. It, it falls out every single time. There, there's no, there's been no outliers on that whatsoever in my experience. If they plan well, they test well, their project comes out you know, on time without the security delays. And, and that alone ha has got a lot of business level buy-in um, from the projects you know, I, I've seen personally. Yeah, that's a great idea to, to take out a legacy SOW and, and the timelines and compare it. Uh, because usually there isn't a control to, to figure this out with any kind of hard data. What's been the biggest aha moment for your stakeholders? When did they really get it? Reuse, you know, solve a problem once and, uh, and, and use that solution in more than one place. Um, you know, those, those central solutions, yes, there's 10 different ways to solve a specific problem, but if you have one that works, it, it's surely to be the better of the options on the table all, all the time. Yeah, I know of a CEO of a hotel chain that finally got religion when his own points, points were stolen. So... Um, <laughs> You know, that, that works. What, what else? I think, uh, you know, uh, Ajoy mentioned it earlier that, you know, if you are trying to convince people that a, a Band-Aid is, is cheaper, it, it's, it's never the case, right? Uh, after you find the problem, then you go fix it. So if you can bake it out in, in the very inception during the requirement phase, and there's a lot of studies out there, and, and actually... Uh, uh, Microsoft has done a pretty good job of bringing in, as, as part of the SDL, they've got a lot of papers where they've worked with organizations and business case and it's available on their uh, website. Um, and, and that might help you, that, that when you are actually sitting down with a product manager or a business manager um, or even a development manager, that, you know, why you should uh, big security in at the very inception. I think there's two aha moments I've seen with my management. I share them with you. One is that when they see the bill for fixing the problem at the end, they really reject that and, and they, they hate the fact that the delay that a software rollout causes. But the second one is when FBI calls, you know, when they say, oh, you, you know, what? <laughs> that software that you thought was secure, it's not secure. So um, you should have made it secure. So those are the two. Yeah, the other one, good expression I've heard is notification by lawyer. Uh, that, that's another one that, you know, you get a cease and desist letter from somebody you've been attacking and didn't know it. Um, so, that, yeah, that's another, that's another big aha moment. And just to uh, write on what uh, Ramin said, there are a lot, lot of regulators out there and regulations out there which require privacy, and some of the privacy safeguards are through security controls, and the regulators are actually enforcing it. Like, for example, HIPAA. No one was going after HIPAA. With high tech, people are going after it. So there is a business case to now to try and uh, protect and bring that security in. Just to kind of state the obvious, be kept in obvious, there's different kinds of aha moments. And <laughs> the one that most people would assume is the aha moment is, hey, you just got breached, you just had major. That's an aha moment that you need to think about it, but that's not an aha moment to do it right. And so there's different levels of aha, right? So there's, you know, people that aren't doing it at all, that kind of stuff's motivating, but often that motivation starts people down the wrong path. And so they want to bolt on, they want to, they call up all their vendors and say, give me the, the tool that solves everything. So there's different levels of aha, just to call out here that, that obviousness, so. Yeah, no, that's great. There, there's also the aha ha, 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 moment, where you get to say, I told you so, which, uh, yeah, a, a lot of people have been doing uh, recently in, in very public places. Um, let's talk about frameworks, because everybody, everybody loves a nice, shiny framework. Um, how do you choose from so many of them, and how do you determine which one is creditable and isn't itself compromised? Um, 
Let me start with uh, Super Optic. Sure, I'm sitting next to someone who actually wrote a framework class. <laughs> if you remember, uh, OWASP now owns it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, a couple of years ago when I started building out an application security practice, it was easier for me to get a framework because I didn't have to go kind of create a lot of documentation on my own. So that was very, very helpful. I started looking at two frameworks. I did look at CLASP. Um, we, we went with the Sigital Touchpoints and the Microsoft SDL, and we kind of cherry-picked, right? So initially we said, ah, oh, we're going to do everything. Bad answer. Can't do everything. So we cherry-picked a couple of activities, and we kind of uh, said, okay, we're going to put uh, out of a budget, we're going to put a certain percentage on each activity, and after a year, we're going to see which one is actually we're getting an ROI on, right? We are really getting benefit. So I think the bottom line is take a framework, any one of them would work, um, and start working one on it and see what works for you, because at the end of the day, you will morph, uh, morph and uh, come up with a methodology that's going to work for your organization. <laughs> and I think more important than which framework you pick, it's working from kind of both ends of the SDLC at the same time. Um, on the training end of the spectrum, if folks can't talk in the same language, if they don't have a certain baseline of knowledge, none of the other controls work very well. And on the other end, if you're not kind of finding what problems you have there uh, at that moment, um, you, you don't really have the push to move it earlier in the SDLC and get those additional controls. So you, you kind of have to work from both directions. Um, and it, it's definitely, uh, you know, a pretty steep hill at the very beginning, without a doubt. I just say, it, there's, there's lots of different frameworks available, right? I don't know if any of the major ones are wrong or bad, right? There's different value. I would say that the key issue is understanding yourself. Understanding who you are, what you do, how you do it, where you're at. Using that information, you can select the most best baseline and then out of which framework baseline you choose, which portions you need to do. But all of it's kind of a mood exercise if you don't actually understand yourself, because if you simply go by, oh, I read this paper that said this one's the greatest, let's put it into play, as Pritik said, you'd say, oh, let's do it all, right? So you really have to start with understanding who you are and where you're at to make those sorts of decisions. Yeah, I'd like to hear what Prevere has to say. Well, um, yeah, good question. Uh, so, yeah, I've, I've participated in building a couple of different frameworks out, and I can, I can at least tell you this, that it really doesn't matter which one you pick. Um, it, it would pick whatever framework actually helps you think about the problem the way your organization works, right? Um, and, and from there, as the project said, um, you know, it's really about picking the activities that actually work for you and that actually give you the most bang for the buck. I will say this about the frameworks in the application security space that I've come to appreciate over the last couple of years, which is that... Um, they're all just focused on application security. If you're in the business of actually protecting your organization from risk, application security is not the only thing you have to worry about. You also have to worry about how you're managing infrastructure, how you're actually managing your networks, how you're managing data, uh, how you're managing vendors. There's lots of other pieces that far, fall out, far outside of just application security. So if you just focus on making your application security program the shiniest, most you know, best part of your security program, you're likely going to get owned by any one of those other things I just mentioned, right? Um, so it's about kind of drawing yourself, you know, stepping back from the framework a little bit and thinking about the problem a little bit more broadly if, if that's what your role is in your organization, which is to kind of protect the organization from risk. So I think I agree with all that has been said. Um, there is one point that I do want to raise when it comes back to the reporting, right? So uh, you mentioned about HIPAA reporting, and then we have PCI, and then we have all regulators asking, and then we have to do information exchange between all of us, right? And we have questionnaires and forms. I think what I would like to see from the frameworks and standards is that they coalesce in some standard shape and form where the reporting is made somewhat simpler because that takes a lot of time mapping one standard to the other, mapping one set of results to the other. It's basically we spend incredible amount of time doing that. I would like to avoid, and I'm sure that uh, vendors who are in this room, some of the vendors who are in this room, they do spend incredible amount of time doing that for us. So we have to find out a better way on how to basically use these frameworks, because currently they are there, they are good, they help you set up a very good program, but they don't help you basically set up a very good story outside, and there has to be some, some initiative to do that. All right, now let me ask you guys, um, what resources from OWASP have helped you the most? 
with your application security program? So I can start with that. Uh, I have been using OWASP since 2004, 2005, and I have been at three organizations. I have used several components of OWASP, starting from education, eSAPI libraries, uh, using OpenSAM, and it's just endless. It basically is part of my fabric, part of DNA. We use OWASP as a common nomenclature. That's how we define vulnerabilities. We rate our vulnerabilities and defects based on OWASP. So it's basically part of our complete ecosystem in any program that I have implemented. So OWASP has been like a uh, stepping stone uh, in basically defining any program for me. The ones that we've used, uh, we've also used the OWASP ORRM, which is the risk rating methodology. It's, it's, it's pretty good, actually, because, but the only uh, caveat is it's very application security focused. So if you want to start using it for a little broader uh, scope, it becomes a little difficult, and you've got to make a little bit of adjustments. The other one that we use is WebGoat. WebGoat is uh, uh, something that uh, has, has helped us and helped uh, us work with uh, a lot of our uh, app teams, and they can, they can actually uh, try it out themselves. The SAPI. Stop solving the same problem over and over again, different ways. It's the most valuable piece that we've used out of the mix. Um, you know, I, I've used tons of other resources, I'm sure, but that that really is, you know, one of the biggest value adds uh, that that we've, you know, worked on with the community, um, without a doubt. There's one other. Um, I think three years ago, OWASP came up with this addendum for legal contracts. And that was really good because it, it, it kind of, we've been thinking about it for a while and we finally got something, we modified it, and we made that standard with all our professional services agreements. And that was really, really helpful. Yeah, what, one of the most fun things that I ever did was uh, to start putting into our statements of work that any security um, flaws would be remediated at the cost of the vendor regardless of when they were found. And there were a couple of vendors who didn't read the contract before they signed, and that was pretty fun when uh, we got to tell them they, they had to fix that. Um, all right, and then finally, the, speaking of which, the software supply chain, how do you beat, torture, bribe, cajole your partners and your suppliers into doing the right thing? I start with the contract. I think contract is very important. Uh, we also try to do uh, questionnaires with them which they hate, and we actually work together. So, <laughs> so uh, those are two of the methods that we use. We actually do go for inspections as well at times, just to see their data centers, to ensure that the security that they are um, complying with is adequate. Uh, looking at the various regulations, for FISMA regulations for uh, data security, that's another one we actually look at. From an application security, uh, we try to do testing of their apps, but most of the time they reject that. They won't allow us to test their app whether it is in a contract or not, that may determine whether we're allowed to test it or not. Uh, so this is a new initiative for us uh, in terms of software security we have been doing for other products, and it's basically twofold or two points there. One is that we are focused on risk identification first, and then we'll go for the verification. So risk identification part, what we are doing is that we, we have categorized vendors into five categories, like service providers, developer uh, doing full SDLC kind of development, SDLC development hosting, hosting only, and cost vendor. And then we have defined a series of um, uh, controls that should be available based on the vendor type that we would want as an artifact coming from vendors. And then we have a right to inspect. Uh, we'll ask for artifacts up front, but we'll not inspect everything. But over time, I think we do want to inspect everything, but key is to start inspecting or verifying the high-risk products because that would start strengthening the supply chain, and that's the approach we are taking, and this is a new initiative that will, we basically have started a few months back, so we can talk about it in six months how it's going. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, we use a very similar approach. This is one area that we've uh, done a lot of work on, and it starts with purchasing. Purchasing basically, uh, the minute you're talking with the vendor, will, uh, we do something called a VCP, Vendor Classification Profile, and that, that kind of uh, puts you in a bucket. So we rate the vendor, uh, and depending on the rating of the vendor, there are certain activities that we do. So for example, if it's uh, rated 1A, which is the highest vendor, which uh, exposure to GLIBA, PCI, 
a uh, lot of NPPI data, that would require a, a, a tremendous amount of uh, due uh, diligence and effort. We do a lot of the, we do, we do on-site visits. We uh, also rely on third party, especially uh, uh, if it's been done by a reputable third party. We've seen a lot of uh, reports from third parties which are, you know, like two-page report, yeah, security was good. So, uh, <laughs> oh, you, you cannot imagine some, some that we've seen. It's like, yeah, we visited and the security was good. Like, what did you test? Uh, so, naturally, it has to be some, someone who's reputable and we can, we can rely on it because we are basically, our assertions are based on those reports. Uh, a lot of people have 2701 certifications. They have uh, SAS 70s, SAS 16s, and, uh, a lot of vendors, most vendors don't let us pen test, but they will give us pen test results which show if there were any major findings. They don't give us the details of the findings, but at least uh, tell us if there were any major findings, and then they will also give us another report whether those have been remediated. Um, so I'm not going to rehash that, but I think one of the biggest challenges is just engaging the right skill sets at the right time. Like your AppSec team is not going to cover the full gamut of what you need to do, but they need to be engaged under those right circumstances, on the, you know, the, the right level of criticality for these relationships, and, and that's when you need to do the deep dive. And fine-tuning your process to get there is probably the toughest part of this problem. It's having the right people in the room at the beginning that can kind of make those judgment calls across multiple disciplines to, to help the process move, move along efficiently. Otherwise, these things can take forever. Uh, with massive amounts of paperwork, and at the end, I'm not sure there's always a clear conclusion. Um, so that, I think that's the, the toughest part, and I think a lot of us are still trying to fine tune that and figure it out. Yeah. So I think uh, effectively managing supply chain risks begins with where we started this panel with, which is clear, explicit, specific requirements, right? And they're fractal in nature. You have to understand what those are, and then push it down, push it down, push it down. <laughs> so without that, you're just you, you have nothing to measure. It's about a balance of both effective engineering and assurance. So engineering, how do you actually build the stuff in the right way? Assurance, how do you act? There's both of those, right? So you can put requirements in and, and require your, supply, your suppliers to do the correct engineering and to prove they've done certain assurance, but then you need to do assurance as well, right? So again, it's fractal and layered for any of those things. And then it really does also depend on a clear understanding of the threat not only at any given layer of that supply chain, so for any given piece, but a clear understanding of threat across the supply chain. So there's things that come into play across the supply chain when you start to bridge those things um, that are not just one given node or one given piece in that chain. Um, and that's to some degree where, you know, I'm somewhat unique on the panel that I don't, all these guys actually build and have to defend this stuff. That's not what I do at MITRE. I work with folks like this to try and think through some of these problems to try and figure out how we can actually as a community improve those things. And that threat side is where I've been focusing the last couple of years. Doing software assurance was before that. The last couple of years I've been focused on um, working through threat intelligence and how we can have a clear understanding, outward understanding, right? Inward understanding of all the stuff, the requirements, what it needs to do, that's one thing, but we can't possibly fool ourselves into thinking we understand everything. So we need to actually be able to look outward to what the, what the adversaries are likely to do to those systems and software and use that understanding to drive our prioritization of what's important. Yeah. So how do you define the requirements by the actual reality of the threat? The abstract threat and the specific threat. If you are a financial institution working in New York at a certain scale and you're also a media company, you face a certain kind of threat that another financial institution might not. So understanding that is very important to actually drive for what you actually do and how you push those requirements down your supply chain. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I see we've we got to wrap up. I see one question in the audience. What is your biggest threat as financial services folks? All of the, all of the FIs and the <laughs> Yours. Well, you know, uh, depends on the business, right? If you're a retail business, your threat is very different. If you are an investment bank, your, your threat is very different. So it totally depends on the business. Uh, for retail customers, we worry about identity because that is a big, big, big problem. Because uh, you, you could be, uh, and, and, and there's a lot of guidance that uh, the, the regulators have come up with. Uh, there's something called the FFIC AIBE that's uh, uh, authentication in the internet banking environment. And there are certain things you have to do. Uh, if you are a, um, 
an investment bank with not that much uh, external presence, you have to worry about the insider threat, right? And the insider threat is not just software security. It's segregation of duties. It's making sure your Chinese walls are appropriate. And there are certain assertions you have to make to your regulators, and you have to make sure that you actually have the safeguards in place to actually <laughs> to, to, to make that happen. And previously, it was maybe at, you know, at a... At a um, at a role level or uh, at, at a much, uh, uh, for example, you could be a trader on one desk, but now it's gone down to portfolios, right? You have to really worry about which portfolios, uh, uh, because uh, you know, th there are a lot of uh, inventive people out there, and they, they are stretching the envelope, and therefore we have to now put in a lot more safeguards. Yeah, awesome. All right. Um, Ramin, you want to add the last word? I, I wanted to actually add something to that because um, one of the risks that we see that... The Can you speak into the microphone? Uh, one of the biggest risks that we see since uh, last year when Knight Capital happened, which was uh, as a result of an uh, incorrect software code and the execution of um, about $400 million incorrect trades, one of the biggest ones that we see right now is actually QA, rollout of the code, and making sure that it doesn't cause permanent damage to the company. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to ask all the panelists to stand outside here so that we can clear the room for the next speaker. But if you want to come and ask questions and, and tell stories in private, which is always the best part, feel free to join them. Thank you, everybody, for showing up.